Here we have chapter one, advanced biology, a view of life. So really quick, an outline of the chapter. First, we're going to define life and discuss what emergent properties are. And in those topics, we'll discuss the uh, areas of matter and energy, reproduction and development, adaptations, natural selection, classification, which includes organization and diversity, natural selection. We'll talk about organization in the biosphere and talk about the human population and biodiversity. And then, of course, we'll talk about research and science, which revolves around the scientific method. And you've been introduced to the scientific method before, and you know it consists of steps that include observation, making a hypothesis, data collection, drawing your conclusions, and if enough, enough uh, support is there, uh, making scientific theories. So defining life. Uh, just as a quick show up in the top region here, uh, if there is a... Um, new subtitle, then that means it's the new subtitle for that, and all the notes underneath relate back to that subtitle. So our subtitle now, under the chapter title, A View of Life, is Defining Life. So these next few slides are going to talk about ways in which biologists define life. And because we're studying biology, the study of living things, bio is uh, life, logi, study of, we're going to need to define what life is because we live in a world that includes both living and non-living things. So what are these living things that we are going to learn a lot about at the molecular level, which is microscopic, up to some macroscopic properties? So living things, they are composed of the same chemical elements, um, and we'll study more about these elements in our next chapter, but uh, chemical elements are elements that include carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. These are some of the major elements that make up all living things. And because we're talking about elements, we're looking at chemistry, and we need to say that these atoms come together and they obey the same physical and chemical laws as elements that make up non-living matter. So we'll discuss some of those in Chapter 2 as well. So living organisms consist of cells. So these elements will come together to form molecules, and these molecules come together to form the basic unit of structure and function, which is the cell. And all living things have one or more cells. If you are an organism composed of one cell, you are said to be unicellular. If you have more than one cell, <clears throat> you are multicellular. So basically, what do we know about cells? We know that the cell is the basic structure and functional unit of all living things, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, protists. They also, uh, cells come from pre-existing cells. So new cells come from pre-existing cells. And cells are the smallest units that perform all vital physiological functions in living things. So living things can be microscopic, such as bacteria. You are covered with bacteria right now on your skin, but you can't see them unless you've had a microscope. And even then you may not be, be able to see them until you stain them. Uh, and a paramecium, here you can see a picture of bacteria and a paramecium right there. But living things can also be macroscopic. And macroscopic means uh, able to be seen with that uh, with the naked eye or the unaided eye. So uh, many multicellular organisms are macroscopic. So here we see a snow goose, a sunflower. So here we have a representative from the animal kingdom, a representative from the plant kingdom. Here's a morel, which is a representative of the uh, kingdom fungi. So living things can be both microscopic and macroscopic. Humans, of course, are macroscopic organisms. Each level of organization in life has emergent properties. And the levels of organization range from extreme micro, such as atoms and molecules and cells, to a global organization, such as a community, ecosystem, and biosphere. 
So as you go from the micro to the macro, each level of organization becomes more complex than the level preceding it. And this is where emergent properties come in. Emergent properties are when you have interactions between the parts that make up the whole. And all emergent properties follow the laws of both physics and chemistry. So let's look at this. So at the basic unit, we have the atom. And we know that atoms are composed of subatomic particles known as protons, neutrons, and electrons. And what determines the chemical properties of atoms are the electrons. And electrons, uh, depending on what they do, will determine whether the atom bonds or not. It could bond ionically, covalently, so on and so forth. So when you get atoms that bond together, and especially when we're talking about the atoms that make up living things, you form two <laughs> molecules. And molecules are when you have one or more atoms that have come together to form a larger structure. And in chapter three, we'll look at some uh, molecules related to living things. That would be our ch chapter focusing on biochemistry, the chemistry of life. From there, molecules will come together to form the cell. And the cell is the basic unit of structure and function of all life. And you could be multicellular, unicellular. And then cells will come together to form tissues. And tissues, as we see here, we have both plant tissue and uh, nerve tissue of humans. Tissues are a collection of cells that are specialized to form a, a common function or, or some type of function. So if we look at the, if we look at the uh, cell here, here we have a neuron, and here we have in the tissue level of organization, we have nervous tissue. And then we have a collection of tissue that comes together to form the organ. And this is a collection of tissue that forms a specific function. Here it would be the organ level. So we're talking about, if we look here, it would be the brain. And you can think about the many functions of your brain, which is composed of nervous tissue. And then when you have many organs that come together that have a common goal or function, you're at the system level. So the organ system here would be the nervous system, where you have the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. So you could talk about the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. And then, of course, when you put all the body systems together, you have the organism as a whole. And in this case, we're looking at the African elephant. So that's all body systems coming together to form the complete organism. And when we talk about organism, we could be talking about any living thing, any living thing. You could be looking at the elephant, you could be talking about a bacteria, a protist, or you could be looking at us, the human organism. When you have the same organism living in a general area, that would be a population. So you could be looking at a population of African elephants. Here you could be looking at a, a population of uh, balboa trees in there, in the African Sahara, uh, population of zebra, population of lion, a population of a certain type of grass. That would be uh, many populations living in a general area. But when you take all those populations together, now you have a community. And a community is when you have those populations and they start to interact with one another. And then, of course, all those communities would make up the ecosystem. And an ecosystem is when you have the living world starting to interact with the non-living world. And also at the community level. So you have all these different ecosystems that would come together. So you have the community plus you have the physical environment. So this brings us to two terms, biotic and abiotic. When you talk about an ecosystem and you have the biotic components of that ecosystem, then you're looking at the living things of that ecosystem. However, the abiotic, when you throw that vowel in there, letter A, that means not. So abiotic is non-living. So in an ecosystem, you have both the biotic, the living things, the animals, the plants, the fungi, the protists, the bacteria that live in this 
abiotic world. What things of that ecosystem are abiotic? Think about it. If you said things like air, water, land are all abiotic, sunlight, you are correct. Now, the ecosystems, when you have the communities plus the physical environment, come together to form the biosphere. And the biosphere is the sphere of life. The sphere of life extends so far into our atmosphere, which is the sphere of gas, and so far down into the depths of our ocean, which is part of the hydrosphere. The hydrosphere is the sphere of water. And then, of course, we have the sphere of land called the geosphere, where these three spheres meet. That is where we have the biosphere. So where the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the geosphere all come together, we have the sphere of life. And it's that sphere that we are going to focus on in biology, the sphere of life. And what drives life on Earth? Well, life on Earth is, of course, driven by energy. And solar energy is the uh, main source of energy for all living things on Earth, unless, of course, you are uh, down at the ocean deep. And we'll talk about a type of energy down there. But energy required to maintain organization and conduct life-sustaining processes. Of course, that would be related to the sun. The ultimate source of energy for nearly all life on Earth comes from the sun. Certain organisms, such as plants, capture solar energy to carry out photosynthesis. Photosynthesis then transforms that solar energy into chemical energy, organic molecules, that other organisms will use. It's that chemical energy that is used by animals, um, such as insects, humans, and that chemical energy will be converted to carry out the functions that we need in order to sustain ourselves to live. When we talk about those reactions from photosynthesis to uh, cellular respiration to produce energy to the many reactions of an organism, we're looking at metabolism. And metabolism is all the chemical reactions that occur in a cell or in an organism. Because remember, some organisms are unicellular, so it's that one cell that metabolizes many things, does a lot of metabolism to keep that cell alive. And we need these reactions to occur because without them, our internal conditions would go out of whack. So we need to have chemical reactions that produce energy, but we all need to ha also need to have chemical reactions that help keep uh, things like temperature, uh, things like blood sugar, um, uh, water, pH, all these things in, in, in a certain range need to have a, a certain balance. And when we talk about those conditions, when we talk about the maintenance of those internal conditions, that would be homeostasis. And these are two terms that you are going to hear repeatedly throughout the school year. So learn them now. Metabolism, the totality of chemical reactions within a cell and an organism. And then when you maintain that stable internal condition to allow metabolism to occur, that is homeostasis. It's the maintenance of internal conditions. It's that stability. Homeo means the same. So we're talking about the same state this stable state that organisms need to maintain in order to function. And of course, we could do all that when we acquire energy, whether we're an herbivore, an omnivore, a carnivore, a detritivore, or if we're a, a organism that would make its own food, such as a photosynthetic organism or a chemosynthetic organism. And we'll talk about all these things because that's where it relates to a producer versus a consumer. A producer or an autotrophic organism versus a heterotrophic slash uh, consumer.